Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to the discussion on CLL that's taking place right now here in Banff, Canada, as part of the Sea Cold meeting. I am lucky enough to be here with two of my esteemed colleagues. I've got uh, Dr. Davids, who's Director of Clinical Research, Divisional Lymphoma at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute at Harvard Medical School. And I've got Dr. Tam, who is here, uh, Head of Lymphoma at Alfred Hospital and Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. So we just had a super exciting uh, session on CLL this morning. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Laurie Sen from BC Cancer here in uh, Vancouver, Canada, and I'll be representing the Canadian perspective because I think what we're seeing more and more is that there's so much new data emerging on CLL, and we're really sort of struggling to put that into the context of the Canadian landscape. So the purpose of this discussion is really to discuss some of this novel emerging data in CLL. We want to kind of review how this data is impacting practices in the US, Australia, and of course, Canada inevitably. Also to think about sort of where the future of CLL treatment is going, what data might be emerging. I think it's really an exciting time. We're going to focus our discussion probably mainly on BTKIs or BTK inhibitors today because we've really seen some recent data that I, I think has become very topical. So let's segue in with a discussion on the first line treatment setting. We know that ibrutinib was the first to market BTK inhibitor and, and first in class, and it was the one that was predominantly used. We also know now that we are seeing second generation data emerging and and really the second generation BTK inhibitors have probably become the preferred agents based on the weight of the data. But Matt, why don't you tell us about the Elevate TN trial and, and basically describe the design of that trial, what we learned, and how that's influenced your practice. So we had seen some promising single arm studies with acalabrutinib in the frontline setting, and the question became, would this hold up when it went into the phase three setting with Elevate TN? So this is a study that really put acalabrutinib to the test with larger numbers of patients in a comparative fashion. There's three arms in the study. These are all previously untreated patients with CLL, tended to be older patients or those with comorbidities, included all comers from a genetic perspective, so high-risk patients, low-risk patients. And they were randomized to either a control arm of obinutuzumab plus chlorambucil, six-month treatment, or continuous treatment with acalabrutinib in one of two arms. So one of the arms was acalabrutinib monotherapy. The other arm was acalabrutinib combined with obinutuzumab for about a six-month combination, followed by acalabrutinib monotherapy continuously. What we're seeing from Elevate TN now with five years of data is very durable progression-free survival in the range of about 78 to 84 uh, percent in those two acalabrutinib arms. A little bit longer with the combination with obinutuzumab, which is kind of interesting, uh, but does seem to be holding up with longer-term follow-up. Uh, and certainly both acalabrutinib arms were superior to obinutuzumab plus chlorambucil. So that was useful in terms of getting the drug registered. But I think as we continue to follow these data out, we're also seeing very good tolerability of acalabrutinib, and it does appear to be different. I'm sure we'll get into the head-to-head -head study. But even in this frontline population, relatively low rates of atrial fibrillation, hypertension, very encouraging data for acalabrutinib in the frontline setting. So I have to say that trial has been very influential here in Canada. So we have, as a result of the data from that trial, moved toward a calibrutinib, I'd say, as a preferred agent in patients that are being started newly on BTK inhibitors. We haven't really adopted the combination with the venetuzumab. I, I think, you know, primarily it's a bit of a confusing comparison, I, I think, and, and not clear that it added a substantial enough benefit for the additional concern for toxicity. I also think that during the pandemic, you know, we were concerned about the use of um, anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies, you know, if the potential value didn't outweigh the cost. So, um, so I think that has been a, a transformative study for us and, and really changed how we practice here in Canada. But Khan, why don't you tell us about the Sequoia trial? Maybe you can describe the design of that trial and what the main findings were. Sure. So the Sequoia study is, one, is a frontline study of zanabrutinib. Uh, it's a phase three study comparing zanabrutinib against bendamustin rituximab. Uh, 
um, and it's designed for patients who are not fit for FCR therapy. So very similar to the Alliance study, which is ibrutinib versus BR, where ibrutinib was better. Uh, not surprisingly, in the Sequoia study, Zanabrutinib did better than bendamustine rituximab. Uh, the two-year progression-free survival is approximately 90%. Uh, so further follow-up uh, you know, is required. Um, the other interesting piece of data from the Sequoia study was that there was actually a third arm of patients with 17p deletion. So we created a third arm because it was unethical uh, to randomize patients with 17p to bendamustine. So these patients were assigned zanabrutinib monotherapy, uh, and there were over 110 patients in their arm. So it was one of the biggest collections of frontline 17p patients treated uh, with uh, anything, and in particular a BDK inhibitor. And you know, it's, I always hesitate to co compare across arms, but the progression-free survival in the 17p arm looks remarkably similar to the progression-free survival of the uh, patients without 17p who goes on the route in the randomized arm. So, so far, uh, that's been a very encouraging piece of data. So how has that data influenced your practice in Australia? Well, we don't have frontline zanabrutinib or any frontline BDK access in Australia. I think that if we do get access to that um, in the future, that uh, it will make BDK inhibitors really, uh, you know, a, really a preferred treatment for patients uh, who have got especially unmutated RGVH uh, status, and especially the ones who have got 17p deletion, where I think the frontline 17p data is looking very strong. For RGVH unmutated patients, um, I think if we have everything that's available, then both um, a frontline BTKI or vinyoclax or map are good options for those patients. And Matt, how has that data affected your practice? So we got Xanabrutinib labeled in the US about two months ago for frontline CLL, so it's, it's nice to have options. I, I would say I've been using acalabrutinib now for, for many years, so I'm curious to get more experience with Xanabrutinib. Uh, I've already had specific patient scenarios where it's been useful. For example, we know that he headache is a fairly common side effect with acalabrutinib, and I had a patient recently who needed to start frontline therapy on a BTK inhibitor and didn't want to risk the, the headaches, and so chose xanabrutinib, so it was nice to have that flexibility. Um, on the flip side, we have patients who struggle with hypertension already, and xanabrutinib, as we'll hear, I think, in the head-to-head -head data set, didn't look that different from ibrutinib, and so acalabrutinib has the low rate of hypertension, so I think it's nice to have options to really tailor the therapy to individual patients. Mm -hmm. We saw some really exciting data on Xanabrutinib at the recent ASH meeting, of course, presented in a late-breaking session with the Alpine study. And maybe, Khan, you can tell us about the design of that trial and the main findings and, and why it was such an important trial presented. Mm -hmm. So the Alpine study is a head-to-head -head phase three comparison of Xanabrutinib versus Ibrutinib in relapsed CLL. Uh, so these are patients who have usually have had a medium one line of therapy. Uh, it's a straight head-to-head -head randomization. And the reason why the trial gathered so much interest was because there was uh, not only a, a high response rate, which is the primary endpoint, but actually a superior progression-free survival uh, in favor of zanabrutinib in that study. Uh, so that was one of the first indication that maybe one, uh, one form of BDK inhibitor may have greater efficacy over another form. Now, the design of the study was actually, um, you know, was, there was a lot of interest around, around the design of the study because of this result. And the question was, you know, why, was, why did this, PF, this PFS advantage emerge? Um, so there were certain, Matt would describe the Alcalabrutinib study, but there's certain differences between the two studies. Uh, for a start, the study did not enrich for high-risk pa high patients, whereas the Alcala study did. It's actually an open label study as opposed to a blinder study. So there was some concern that maybe you know, physicians uh, you know, knew what p their patients were on. And you know, in the age of ibrutinib, where we knew the second generation agents were safer, maybe there was a, a lower threshold for uh, stopping ibrutinib in the ibrutinib arm. Um, having said that, the progression, the number of patients who actually had disease progression on drug, but still higher for the ibrutinib arm. Um, and then the study's design was also a tiny bit quirky in that 
the primary endpoint was a response rate endpoint, and it was a response rate endpoint built without the category of partial response with nephocytosis, which we know to be a beneficial category. Having said that, uh, notwithstanding those, those, those of you know, slightly odd oddities, um, the primary endpoint was met. It was, it was superior to ibrutinib in terms of response. It was uh, superior even when you add back in the PR with lymphocytosis category. And then that positive primary endpoint then triggered the analysis of the progression-free survival as a secondary endpoint, which showed the difference in progression-free survival. And the power calculation was such that um, you were able to make a conclusion about the PFS without spending the alpha from the primary analysis. So it was felt that the PFS uh, P value was a, uh, was a, you know, was a real value. So we had a, a similar trial, of course, in the relapse refractory setting comparing a calibrutinib versus a brutinib. And Matt, why don't you tell us about the design of that trial and the take home message and how we interpret that result in the context of the Alpine trial? Sure. So very similar idea, relapse refractory CLL patients, but in Elevate RR, they enriched for high risk patients. Actually, at the time the study was designed, they still thought that deletion 11Q would be high risk in the context of BTK inhibitors. Turns out that's not so much the case. But uh, most of the patients did have deletion 17P, so truly high risk CLL patients. And they were randomized one to one to continuous abrutinib or acalabrutinib. And the primary endpoint of Elevate RR was progression-free survival in a non-inferiority design. So from the start, that was the endpoint they were looking for. Uh, and what they found actually was that both arms did extremely well uh, for that high-risk population. The median progression-free survival was 38.4 months in both arms. So the hazard ratio was 1.00, easy number to remember. So clearly showed non-inferiority of acalabrutinib to ibrutinib. But there were a lot of improvements around tolerability with acalabrutinib. Lower rates of hypertension, for example, 9% versus 23% with ibrutinib. Lower rates of atrial fibrillation as well with acalabrutinib. Overall, a lower discontinuation rate as well. So I, I think it clearly showed safety advantages of acalabrutinib over ibrutinib. Uh, similar efficacy. You know, as I kind of think across the two studies, one of the things that's actually a little more puzzling to me is why there was no PFS advantage observed in Elevate RR, but there was in, in Alpine. And I don't have a great answer for it, to be honest, because uh, in a sense, that's the more surprising result in Elevate RR, because you clearly have a drug that's better tolerated. They showed that patients stayed on the drug for longer. So why did they not have a longer PFS? And I don't think we know the answer to that. I do wonder, you know, this is a heavily pretreated population, median of two prior lines of therapy instead of one, who was mainly prior chemoimmunotherapy, high-risk disease. You know, is there potentially some efficacy advantage of abrutinib? in those later line patients with high risk disease that maybe balanced out the toxicity differences? I don't think we'll really ever know, uh, but that's one hypothesis. So differences between the studies, I think, do make it difficult to do cross trial comparisons here. It's tempting to try to use the transitive property to say, oh, well, if Xanu is better than abrutinib and Acala is equivalent to abrutinib, maybe Xanu is better than Acala. I think that's a really tricky assumption to make, so I'm not prepared to do that myself. Yeah, I would agree. Although, you know, one of the intriguing things of the Alpine trial, again, and you don't want to make too much of subgroup analyses, but they did look at the 17P deleted subgroup separately. And um, if anything, they, that group seemed to have even a better benefit um, over the abrutinum. So I, if you had a patient that was 17P deleted and you had to pick a BTK inhibitor, do you have a preferred one based on the weight of the data? I would say that uh, there's a couple of possibilities that come to mind as to why that could be. So one is that xanabrutinib really is a better BTK inhibitor, especially for high-risk patients, and that's why you're seeing that difference even more. The other is that some of the issues that Khan alluded to, where if patients did stop abrutinib because of tolerability issues, you'd expect those patients with high-risk disease to progress faster. So that's why maybe you see those curves widening. So to me, and it's a relatively small subgroup, so I, it's not that impactful for me. It certainly makes xanabrutinib a good option to consider, but I think acalabrutinib is still very reasonable also for the high-risk patients, especially since there were more of those patients on Elevate RR. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think that uh, they're both good, good drug options. So, I, I mean, I have to say it's been a changing landscape in Canada for sure. So. Um, based on Alpine, we anticipate that that will be coming forward and, and hopefully will be an option for us as well. Right now, though, based on the weight of all the information, it, it's clear that second-generation BTK inhibitors have become preferred based on their 
uh, more favorable toxicity profiles. And I'd say that for all the patients that I'm treating with BTK inhibitors, you know, I am no longer starting new patients on abrutinib. I'm not necessarily switching the patients that are currently doing well on abrutinib to second generation because generally we don't like to upset the apple cart and, and I have many patients that are tolerating it well and, and holding their disease well. But it, in a new start, it is my practice to use a calibrutinib instead of a brutinib. And of course, we'll need to probably have some decisions made along the way as Xanabrutinib comes forward onto the market. And Cotton, can you describe sort of the, how would we think of Xanabrutinib different from a calibrutinib in terms of its target mechanism and the main differences in toxicity that you see? So the two drugs are quite similar in that they're both selective BDK inhibitors, so they're cleaner than ibrutinib. And in aggregate, the, you know, these two drugs in head-to-head -head studies have shown a lower rate of atrial fibrillation, and in two out of three studies, also a reduction in the rate of hypertension. So I think that they're less, to they're less toxic than ibrutinib. Comparing between the two drugs, um, I tend to see uh, the the basic pharmacology is being a little bit different. Zanabrutinib um, is given uh, to achieve a very high PK level and very complete uh, BDK blockade, even in deep tissue. Uh, Acalabrutinib is probably, um, you know, those optimized to get a very effective BDK inhibition in blood, but has uh, a less, but is less, it's not dosed to such a high level um, probably not those as high level as uh, the Zanabrutin is. Um, now, that we don't know whether, whether the impacts on any clinical responses. Certainly, the, the, the side effects of the two drugs, which have not been compared head to head, both appear favorable to the ibrutinib. Um, so that I think that there's not much to choose between those two side effects. Um, they're both given twice a day. Acalabrutinib, at least in its current formulation, um, has an interaction with PPIs, but that's about to be solved with a new formulation uh, that's being released. Uh, Acalabrutinib is associated with a very, um, as Matt mentioned, a headache, but the headache tends to be quite short-lived uh, and well-controlled and resolved, so I don't see that as a barrier to prescription. So I think both drugs are actually really good options. It just depends on um, you know, what choice is available um, and whether you're going for a, a a really high drug level and really deep inhibition, or you're going for a you know a an adequate amount of of inhibition, which is what acalabrutinib gives you. And, and just to add briefly, in the U.S., we do have the tablet formulation already of acalabrutinib, which has been very nice. We have so many patients who need PPI therapy. Mm -hmm. Some maybe who don't need it and think they need it, but uh, it's nice to have that flexibility now. Um, on the flip side, one of the challenges I think with acalabrutinib is when you need to dose reduce. Uh, I do worry a little bit it's a short half-life drug and just giving it once a day, are you really getting the kind of BTK coverage you need? Xanabrutinib does have a bit of a longer half-life and as you heard, the, the very favorable pharmacodynamic properties. And so it has the label of daily or BID dosing. And so I think it's a little easier to dose reduce xanabrutinib, maybe even giving it daily, but still feeling a little more comfortable like you have that coverage. So that's a potential advantage. So now that you have it available, do you think if you're starting a patient on it, you would start it twice daily in the majority of patients and consider daily? Yes, in some? yes. I mean, the preponderance of the phase three data are with BID dosing, so with Xanabrutinib, so I do feel more comfortable starting with that, but it's nice to know I have that flexibility if, if I run into trouble with toxicities. Mm -hmm. I, I think the practice has been really guided based on the difference in toxicity profiles. And Matt, maybe you can just summarize sort of how you see the differences in toxicity between the BTK inhibitors <clears throat> and how that might influence your choice of individual BTK inhibitor based on the patient in front of you. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll focus mostly on the comparison between acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib, because as you said, for us also, we're not doing a lot of new starts, if any, really, with ibrutinib these days. Although I will just highlight that I do think the ventricular dysrhythmias and sudden cardiac death with ibrutinib are a real issue. It's a very low number of patients, but we've seen that across studies. And it's really not something that we've seen reported much with the newer generation. There was this one interesting report from Ohio State published in Blood recently that saw a small number of ventricular arrhythmias in patients on acalabrutinib, although that included ventricular premature contractions, so unclear sort of what the significance is of that. And the larger pooled data analyses of safety for acalabrutinib have not really shown ventricular arrhythmias. So I'm hopeful with both acala and XANU that that risk is, if not zero, very close to it.
So you know, then I think the questions around hypertension are, are interesting. Um, as Khan pointed out, most of the Xanabrutinib data sets have not shown a significantly elevated risk of hypertension. Um, you know, the, the Alpine study is a bit of an exception there, where you do see in a randomized comparison with ibrutinib similar rates of hypertension. So it casts a little bit of doubt on that. With acalibrutinib, it's been pretty clearly consistently lower rates of hypertension. Uh, on the flip side, with atrial fibrillation, the xanabrutinib numbers have looked very good. The follow-up's a little bit shorter. Numerically, it looks like it might be a little bit lower than with acalibrutinib, but again, it's not comparative data. And, and then, you know, some of the other kind of more nuisance toxicities like headache, as, as, as we've discussed, do differ between the drugs. Neutropenia, maybe a little bit higher with, with xanabrutinib. Um, so these are all factors we can consider, but I would say overall, with xanu and acala, they're more similar than they are different. So I think the cardiac toxicities have been the greatest concern with uh, BTK inhibitors. Do you do any special cardiac monitoring in your patients, or, or how do you follow your patients? I don't. I tend to get a baseline EKG just to make sure I have that on the books. I have not been getting baseline echocardiograms, for example, um, but uh, certainly I always ask patients whether they've had symptoms of palpitations. Uh, we, we always uh, examine our patients, of course, to make sure they don't have irregular heart rhythms. But other than that, no specific monitoring for us. I don't know. Yeah, if you do it differently. No, we do exactly the same. Take a you know clinical history, do a baseline uh, ECG. Um, we did a study previously where we looked at patients with cardiac MRIs and echocardiograms at baseline, mm -hmm. and that did not predict for cardiac toxicity. Yeah. Um, so you know, and obviously we warn the patient that if they have any symptoms of palpitations or syncope, to you know let us know immediately. Mm -hmm. um, probably the only. Uh, the, other thing different we do is that there's an increasing sense that hypertension is a risk factor for cardiac problems with BDK inhibitors. So and I tend to check the blood pressure and make sure that the blood pressure is well controlled before we start BDKI. So Con, you recently did a review of cardiac toxicity in the setting of Xanabrutinib. Do you mm -hmm. want to summarize what you found from that compilation yep. data? So uh, there was a recent review uh, that we presented where we looked at the, every patient that's been treated on a Zanabrutinib study, so that's about 1,500 patients. And some of those patients, such as Aspen and Alpine, also had patients enrolled in the same study who received ibrutinib. So we looked at the rates of, you know, of atrial fibrillation, cardiac events, idiopathic ventricular arrhythmias, uh, between Zanabrutinib and ibrutinib, both within the randomized population and then also against the pooled population and the ibrutinib data. Uh, and so far what we've seen is not unexpectedly a reduction in atrial fibrillation. We already knew that from the individual clinical trials. But we also saw a reduction in the risk of idiopathic ventricular arrhythmias uh, in favor of zanabrutinib. But having said that, this is, um, you know, we're talking about small numbers here, so the confidence intervals can, can be quite wide and can fluctuate with you know, additional events. But I think there is one piece of data that gives me some hope that the second generation drugs are safer than the first generation with regards to ventricular arrhythmias. So what, what data in the frontline setting would you say you're most excited about learning? What's coming next? There's a few major studies that are going to be reading out in the next couple of years in CLL. One of them that I think we'll see the soonest is probably the CLL-13 study. We've seen it presented at ASH. As a reminder, these are patients treated with various venetoclax combinations compared to chemoimmunotherapy. One of the arms actually has triplet therapy with abrutinib, venetoclax, and obinutuzumab. And so I think it's going to be interesting as we start to explore triplet-based novel agents and versus doublets, that study's going to be informative there. Uh, and then other studies that are, you know, continuing to move along are CLL-17, which is comparing continuous abrutinib to time-limited abrutinib venetoclax or venetoclax obinutuzumab. Uh, we'll hopefully see data on that in the next couple of years. The AMPLIFY study, which will hopefully lead to registration for acalabrutinib venetoclax-based combinations, either with or without obinutuzumab. Uh, and then our MAGIC study, which is the AV doublet versus ven obin, which is just accruing patients now. So a lot of really impactful studies, I think, that are on the way. So I think it's remarkable what's going to be coming down the world of clinical trials that we're going to need to digest and further consider for clinical practice. Right now, I'd say that things are really changing in the Canadian landscape, and, and Canada sometimes is a little bit behind, but uh, you know um, we do have moved away from chemoimmunotherapy, of course, in the frontline setting, so it's all about novel targeted therapy. There are probably two camps. Most of us do have access to the time-limited venetoclax and obinutuzumab, which recently has just emerged and, uh, and is a funded 
option, but we also have BTK inhibitors. And, and so I think you know, the big debate continues to be time limited up front versus BTK inhibitors. But clearly for patients starting on BTK inhibitors, um, we've moved away from ibrutinib more and more to the second generation because of at least the advantage we've seen in terms of toxicity. Acalabrutinib is now available in the Canadian landscape, and we don't yet have xanabrutinib, but we anticipate that it's coming, and, and we are going to need to kind of digest the xanabrutinib information and, and figure out where it's going to fit in. So what clinical trials are you most excited about, or what novel agents are coming down the road that is going to maybe fall into the landscape as well? And I'll start with you, Khan. Um, so I, I, I think that you know the BTK story has not finished. You know we've got first and second generation drugs now. We now have third generation, you know, pertubrutinib, nantabrutinib, reversible inhibitors, which are clearly effective when the first and second generation stop working. And then there are now uh, you know, CDAC or PROTAC molecules that destroy BTK. So I, I don't. I think the BTK story is not finished. That there is. Um, additional ways to hit the same pathway, and I'm interested to know, um, you know, what the results of the new generation of drugs are, and also, um, it was an emerging story is just the mutational profile between the different drugs, and we're starting to appreciate that different drugs in the uh, BDK uh, class may actually give you a slightly different uh, variety of mutations outside of the classical system 481 position, and I do envision that in our time in the next few years where we will actually look at the patient um, when we choose a second or the third BDK inhibitor, where we actually look at the mutational profile and say, you know, which one should we choose based on the, the mutation that is known in this patient at the time of relapse? You know, I'm glad you brought up the idea of mutational profiling because within the Canadian system, we currently don't have access to mutation profiling the patients on BTK inhibitors. So when they do become resistant, we're not able to really um, understand the mechanism in an individual patient. Is that something that you're able to do in your own practice? Yes, we're, we're able to do that. We have our own internal tests. Mm -hmm. There's also send out tests that you can do in the US that, that get reimbursed generally. I would say right now it's not necessarily impacting our, our next line of therapy, but I think to Khan's point, as we learn more about the you know, different BTK mutations and how they're impacted with the different inhibitors, I agree that I think that will be influential in, in the sequencing of how we use covalent and non-covalent inhibitors. Yeah, so we're very lucky to have that done, available at our center. Um, obviously, it's not something that is commonly available. Um, there are some commercial labs that would do it, but we need to be careful because a lot of them actually only look at the 481 position and then they don't actually look at the, the, the rest of the gene. So we need to be clear that I think the, in future the profiling needs to cover the entire gene and look at all the different spots apart from the classical position. Yeah, well, right now it's really relegated to research in Canada and I'd like to see that hopefully as we get more BTK inhibitor options on the market and, and particularly with... Um, the non-covalent ones that will be emerging. I mean, I think it'll be really interesting to see whether or not this, in fact, becomes a clinical tool to guide treatment. So, Matt, what new agents are you looking forward to? So, you know, the other thing that's very exciting right now is, is applying immune-based therapies in CLL. I mean, this is something, as you well know, has started to really revolutionize other B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphomas, specifically CAR T-cell therapy and now bispecific antibodies really seeing outstanding results with these approaches in other B-cell indolent non-Hodgkin lymphomas. So the question I think naturally arises, can these also be effective in CLL? Uh, in my clinic, I'm seeing more and more patients who have progressed through a, a BTK inhibitor and venetoclax and so-called double refractory patients. And these patients will need new options, especially for our younger and fit CLL patients. So uh, CAR-T um, you know, has kind of taken a little detour in, in CLL. I'm hopefully, hopeful that it's kind of coming back. There's some good data with lysocell and a, hopefully a pathway eventually toward registration there. Uh, and then with bispecifics, it's just very early. We've seen very little data with epcaritimab, uh, but we know mozunituzumab is also being studied in CLL, so I'm excited to see those data. I am also a little bit skeptical in CLL that they're gonna be as effective as they are in other lymphomas. We know that the immune dysfunction in CLL is particularly difficult with T-cell function, and these therapies, of course, rely on T-cells to kill. So it may be that we can't use them as monotherapies. We need to find combination partners to enhance the immune effects. So uh, a lot of work left to do still in, in understanding that. Well, I think it's it's already an exciting time, and to see everything that's coming through the pipeline, I think is just 
astounding. So I know that this is not the last discussion we're going to have on the changing treatment landscape, but I, I think that it will continue to be an evolving picture. So with that, I think we'll wrap up this discussion. It's been very informative for me. And, and as, as I said, um, I think that all of our clinics are benefiting from kind of the novel treatments that have emerged. I think that you know, the big winner here has been the CLL patient, where we know that outcomes are improving across the board. And importantly, we're also decreasing the toxicities associated with the treatments that we're administering. So I thank you both for your time today and for participating in the meeting.